very happy to welcome Shirley Andrews to this radio program. She's written a book called Lemuria in Atlanta, Studying the Past to Survive the Future, that goes beyond where we usually are with this subject. Where we usually are with this subject is, was there a Lemuria? Was there an Atlantis? But Shirley is is very far beyond that. Uh, she's had a lifelong interest in prehistory. She's conducted a lot of research in the U.S. at the British Museum in London. Uh, she has been to monasteries in the Himalayas, the Azores, the Andes, Central America. Uh, she's been at the Tio Bastillo Cave in Spain. And she is really, oh, also she's the author of another book, Atlantis, Insights from a Lost Civilization. So we're going to be looking at this in a very different way today. Uh, Shirley, welcome to the program. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Well, uh, first of all, you're absolutely convinced that these civilizations existed. Oh, yes. There's no doubt in my mind. And I, there were others, too. Uh, this has happened on the earth since um, since ours began. So you would be you would be more in your attitude or your ideas about the distant past, like someone like Michael Cremo, who believes that there were quite a number of civilizations de- dating back deep into the past, far far deeper than conventional science believes. Right, and I just read it. I, I agree totally. A book called Cataclysm, which has helped me a lot to understand what happened to these civilizations. You know, if you want me to explain briefly. The, yes, please do. I mean, basically, he's saying that something came into our solar system from outer space. It was a big chunk. It wasn't an asteroid, and it wasn't a comet because it, it had gravitational field. And its gravitational field attracted objects from our solar system and affected them. And he has a lot of things that happened as a result of it. But it came too close to the Earth. A lot of these objects dropped on the Earth's surface, making pockmarks, huge things that are visible today, and it crop, it, t- it tilted our axis. It caused the, um, which caused it to shift a little bit, and, and the, the water in the oceans raised up and back down up towards the poles. Just imagine, we're like a top going around, and something disturbed it. In the meantime, it affected the, the Earth's crust, which really isn't very thick, and it sort of crumpled. And as a result, things changed. Mountains went up and and, uh, and islands went down. And basically, it set off a lot of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. And just imagine like BAM in Iran happening all over the world. People didn't have much of a chance. And all the legends and stories describe this. Uh, and they refer to the flood, which is understandable. And I mean, I'm not going into the details, but that's the general idea of what happened. Yeah, I understand. But what you're saying essentially is that there were, uh, there have been, it has been a great deal more upheaval in the past than our science, our conventional science is willing to admit. That's true. They say things happen. Well, there's there's two branches now. I think. These people who are known as sort of as the cataclysm, cataclysmists right. are gaining increasing popularity and respect, and I think it's it's going to come. This is the, you know that we haven't just think what happened when something hit Jupiter not too long ago. I mean, what if that right. hit the Earth? I mean, of course. Well, it will happen that way, and <laughs> so uh, but but you're saying that these cataclysms have been intent, intense enough not just to destroy civilizations, but to uh, so completely distort our memory of them that uh, that it's really just, it's almost all lost. It becomes myth rather than memory. Well, I think the reason for that is because nothing survived very well. I mean, you know, our books and records would all be gone. The only thing that's really survived are, are writings in stone, and there are a few other things here and there in, in the mountains that have, people have found in, in Asia with information about the motherland of Mu, for instance, Lemuria. Well, let's talk about um, some of those things. I think um, I had three main sources uh, for my information about Lemuria. None of it is channeled. I just have to make that really clear. Um, the main one was Church Word, a British, um, a British soldier who was sent to India. I spent a lot of time there got to know a monk in a temple, who eventually they were friends. The monk 
that taught him how to read a, a script that they called Nikal. And then he said, I have some records that are hidden, very secret archives. They've been there for thousands of years. And they brought one out, and they translated it together, and it was all about Lemuria. And then he brought out a few more. And the problem is these were secret. They will never be released. But Church Word um, really became convinced that they were true. Partly, Church Word was interesting. He invented a kind of steel that our government bought the patent for and used to make helmets for our soldiers in World War One. It was so strong. From this, he got the money, and he spent his whole life traveling in the Far East in Central America learning more and more about Lemuria and writing about it. So that was a good source. Another good source, which also came from the Far East, was um, was from the Rosicrucians. And a man, came, a monk, came to their headquarters in California in the 1920s, and he said, I have some documents here that we've been saving for thousands of years, and we're a little worried about what's going to happen in China and we want to give them to you for safekeeping and authorize you to publish what's in them. And these turned out to also have information about Lemuria. And the Rosicrucians appointed someone to write it who was interested in this topic, and he did. And he said, I, I didn't change anything. I just put down what's, what was in these things, and some of it's a little far out. But that, you know, again, I included some of it in my book. And what I want is to open people's minds and let them make their own decision about what to believe about things that happened so long ago. Also, Edgar Cayce did uh, offer quite a bit about La Maria, and so I included that. Does that help answer the question? Well, yeah. And it, Pretty long-winded it, it, there. It, no, no, no. We're interested in listening to you. Uh, uh, so the more you have, the more information you have to offer us, the better. Uh, let me ask you now about physical remains. I am very familiar with Nan Madal. I've never been there, but uh, I've read a lot and learned a lot about it because I consider it a particularly important, mysterious remain. And uh, But tell us, you have mentioned quite a few of them in Lemurian Atlantis. I had a, a list which someone sent me of 36 places, islands in the Pacific, with pyramids, um, hieroglyphic writing, um, statues, giant statues, megalithic buildings. None of them quite on the scale of Nam Modell, but, but pretty impressive. There's also a really interesting website that if you go to templeofmu.com slash index, there uh, you will see off the coast of Okinawa a temple it has a turtle on the top of it, which is larger than the man swimming around it. There is a road around the bottom, but um, these there are more and more in the Pacific being that's being found, partly because it isn't so deep there as in the Atlantic Ocean, and um, it's more available to just scuba divers. And, um, let's see what else? Of course, Easter Island is a classic. Uh, that island isn't big enough to support the civilization that built those huge platforms weighing some uh, stones of 100 tons in them and the colossal statues on them. And the people of Amuri, of East Island, when they first approached, really said they believed that the, um, you know, that the island had been part of a larger island long ago. And that's who built these things. So, uh, and therefore, you believe that the that the uh, what appear to be megalithic remains uh, near, um, I believe it's the island of Shuri and off Okinawa. Mm-hmm. Well, if you know, if they if they aren't Lemurian, they were built when the ocean levels were higher, which is you mean lower. I mean lower. Sorry, yeah. when that this land, when that area was above the surface, and obviously people lived there, and that was close to 10,000 years ago. Right. The same off the coast of Japan, off the coast of India, and off the coast of Formosa. They're finding things that indicate people did things with the rocks that were already there or actually built building, built ruins, built walls, built whatever. Whatever, yeah. There's controversy about right. it, but, but there's certainly the human hand was there. Okay, this is, this is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. 
Lemuria and Atlantis takes you beyond the question, were there lost civilizations, and says, yes, the evidence is overwhelming. So let's ask some deeper questions. What happened to them? Why did it happen? What is the message for us today? Lemuria and Atlantis by Shirley Anderson, available from the unknowncountry.com store. Great prices, fast shipping. You can't beat it. Lemuria and Atlantis at unknowncountry.com. The veil between the worlds can fall. The undiscovered country can become your backyard. There is a much larger world behind your backs. It is this world to which man is blind. Man is soul blind and God blind. There is no supernatural. There is only the natural world and you have access to all of it. Souls are part of nature. Your concept of the self is constricted. It relates only to this one life. It is tiny. The God within you is unimaginably vast. These are just a few of the things said to me at three o'clock in the morning of June the 6th in 1998 when I was awakened by the master of the key. Get the key. Bring it into your life today. The key available only in this world from the unknowncountry.com store. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back. We're talking with Shirley Andrews, Lemuria and Atlantis, and we're going to begin to go beyond the usual place where we dwell when we're talking about these subjects. Usually we're talking about did they exist or not. And, however, Shirley is convinced not only that they existed, but that there is a message for us, a very important message from the past. And we're going to begin to delve into that message. You know, Shirley, one of the most interesting things in your book were, is the quotes from people who have written you uh, after your first book came out, uh, Atlantis Insights from a Lost Civilization, telling you of their own past life memories. Right, and and some of them are dreams. I'll tell you one dream story. I was in the local store and talking with the owner who had just published a cookbook about the problems of publishers, and a man walking by heard me say Atlantis, and he came up to me and he said, oh, he said, please, can can I talk to you? I, I need your help. I'm having this horrible dream. I know what happened in Atlantis, and I did something that I'm just not very proud of now, and, and can you explain why? And, you know, it's that kind of thing that really, I put that one in my book, really inspired me to write because there's so much interest. There are people everywhere. Wherever I went and spoke, there were people who really had had experiences, had stories to tell me of all kinds. One man in Phoenix said, I grew up in Poland and we learned about Atlantis there. It, and that's, I learned, while well, in the far, in the, in the Eastern Europe, it's much more uh, respected uh, scientists and people who who are concerned about it, and the widespread interest really amazed me. And, and I went to the West Coast, and they stepped asking me about Lemuria, and I really didn't know that much. I, was, I knew it was a seafaring civilization in the Pacific, sort of, within my first book. But then things kept happening. Like I sat down at a conference next to Church Ward's goddaughter, who I'm already mentioned, and she was very close to him, as was her father, and telling me. <laughs> You know, giving me sources and helping me so much to write it with the information. Um, how the only I thing I could recall about James Churchward myself was an amazing uh, something I read of his years ago about the Lord's Prayer. Does that ring a bell at all with you? Oh, um, translated into another language and what each word, how it it was old. That it was that it that he used to th say that it was a very very ancient prayer. Right, yeah. right. And he had he had a he had even the words he was very big on symbols and so forth that it had been in somewhere else. Well, I think in the past people really believed in one one creator, if right. you want to call it one God, whatever. And this certainly is focused on that. He was a very, very. He was a quite an extraordinarily interesting man, a real original uh, of the uh, of the kind that we don't have anymore. Yeah, uh, a Renaissance man. Y yeah, you know, like even a good fisherman. <laughs> right. A whole bit. Right. And uh, you know, he um, he really did to me prove the text of what he had seen in India by his 
cross-references and his facts and, his, well, the legends, the whole bit. And it was just amazing that he wrote as much detail without a computer. Yeah. You know, I don't know how people ever did it. Yeah, well, there was a time when they did it by candlelight uh, or even by oil lamp <laughs> even light. Even harder. <laughs> using wax tablets, and, and right. they were pretty prolific, too. So it can be done. Uh, well, now... Let's go back a little bit. Why don't you take it, uh, draw for us a picture of the world as you see it before the last catastrophe, say before ten thousand years ago? Do you mean geographically or? Well, no. Where, I what have countries would have been important, and and where would right. mankind have been then? I had a wonderful chapter in my book called Other Civilizations, and that. Um, comes from a variety of sources, but it shows that Atlantis and Lemuria certainly would want Atlantis in the... Well, the, one of the reasons I wrote this book is Atlantis started out on the Atlantic Ridge, but the people, it was very unstable, and eventually they, they moved around the Atlantic Ocean, and finally a lot of them went into the Caribbean, and I do believe that the ruins that they're finding there were built by Atlanteans. Maybe they went to Antarctica if it was above the surface. Um, but the business about that they were in the uh, in Mediterranean, um, well, certainly was, they were, but that wasn't their, their, main, their main spot. I think their main spot was gradually more and more in the Caribbean. Because if, if you go back like 50,000 years to the middle of the last ice age, there, there were hundreds of trillions of tons of water that is now free, that was trapped in ice. So world. therefore the continental shelves were exposed, w all the islands were, were much, much bigger. The, the uh, Mediterranean wasn't even connected to right. the Atlantic. Right, right. It, it was, it, it was uh, that land bridge was, uh, there, was a, there was all land between, um, between Spain and North Africa. And presumably the Nile River r ran through what is now the Mediterranean. And, that, it, it, right. and the civilization was there. There was a lake. The, I call it the Osirian, O-S-I-R-I-A-N civilization in my book. Um, who knows, but there are hundreds of uh, buildings in the Mediterranean <laughs> under the water. From now, there time. are, yeah, there is so much under the water. Tell us about the, uh, the land or the, the island that rose in the, in, in, I believe in the 1880s that was found by a crew of a British ship that had a sarcophagus on it and everything? Oh, right, right. They, they were sailing along, and they saw um, a lot of dead fish on the water, a huge amount. And then eventually they, they this came... This was near the Azores? Yes. Yeah. And they came to an what was an island, but it wasn't on their map. They got off and explored it, and uh, they dug under a, a wall and found a sarcophagus with a head in it. This was a British ship, uh, I think it says Jesmond, I think it was called. And it was, the captain wrote it all up very carefully. They also found brown swords there. And he sent some of these artifacts back to the British Museum. Including the sarcophagus. Right. Yeah. And presumably it was lost during the London Blitz. I mean, now, these things now, have a way of disappearing. They you do know? have a way of disappearing, don't yeah. they? And isn't that strange? It is very discouraging. I mean, but so why many do you think that is? So many of the giant skeletons and heads that have been sent to the Smithsonian and other, they just aren't there. Right. All because they can't explain them. They don't go with the classic view, and so, so they just destroy they can't them. can't put them out. They don't know what to say about them. You know, you asked about um, civilizations in the past, too, and another one that they have found evidence of was, in, was the Uyghur civilization. It was up in sort of where Siberia is. And their um, main city was called Karakota, and there's so many Chinese legends about it. They started digging um, south of Lake Bacal, which is a huge, huge lake in Asia. And after 50 feet, they came to the city. They found gold and silver. They found sculptures, um, things that way beyond what the Egyptians had at that time. So that was an, another worthy civilization back then. Uh, in the Pacific, Churchward believed that there was land to the west of Peru, a large, flat plateau, and that that was one of the main islands of Lemuria. 
then that would be, and that would have probably included Easter Island. There's a lot of evidence that Polynesia and all that, Malaysia, those areas were all above the surface. If you look at a map today, you see it's not very deep there and quite possible. Much, much land in the Pacific was above the surface. Another interesting factor is that Churchward found somewhere else, I think in Tibet, a map of uh, South America with a constellation at the top, which he believed indicated what period of time it was it was describing when this map showed. So it was about a map of South America. And the constellation at the top was uh, that way it was in the picture in 28,000 B.C. And the map shows that the Amazon Basin was a huge, huge lake that extended all the way to Tiwanaku, which is on the west coast, not right next to the coast now, but was coast and of uh, South America. And there was an entrance into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, into this huge, huge lake. And the thought is that Tiwanaku now is very, very high, and the mountains near it are even higher. But there's a lot of evidence that before 10,000 B.C., this area was at sea level. I was just reading an interesting Jacques Cousteau went into the lake there Mm -hmm. and was exploring and found some things which uh, the person who wrote to me believes were evidence of the canal that went into the Pacific Ocean from there. We're going to find out a little bit more about this in just a minute. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. The veil between the worlds can fall. The undiscovered country can become your backyard. There is a much larger world behind your backs. It is this world to which man is blind. Man is soul blind and God blind. There is no supernatural. There is only the natural world, and you have access to all of it. Souls are part of nature. Your concept of the self is constricted. It relates only to this one life. It is tiny. The God within you is unimaginably vast. These are just a few of the things said to me at 3 o'clock in the morning of June the 6th in 1998 when I was awakened by the master of the key. Get the key. Bring it into your life today, the key available only in this world from the unknowncountry.com store. Lemuria and Atlantis takes you beyond the question, were there lost civilizations, and says, yes, the evidence is overwhelming. So let's ask some deeper questions. What happened to them? Why did it happen? What is the message for us today? Lemuria and Atlantis by Shirley Anderson, available from the unknowncountry.com store. Great prices, fast shipping. You can't beat it. Lemuria and Atlantis at unknowncountry.com. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back. Lemuria and Atlantis, studying the past to survive the future. Shirley Andrews, quite a statement, Shirley. Uh, what do you think we might be looking at in terms of the future? It seems to me that the that uh, his things that go come around go around. I believe that's right. And therefore, do you believe that this civilization could face the same kind of fantastic uh, blackboard wiping catastrophe? that has struck in the past. Sure. I mean, you know, I, I, I agree. I believe that, that the past is always, com- is always repeated. The, I mean, even Plato said um, he just what was happening in, in Atlantis and in terms of people no longer caring for the earth and being, what did he say, that the, the portion of divinity has them become weak. They've lost their comeliness. They... They unable to bear the burden of their possessions. They're ugly to look upon, and and you know he says that the gods inflict punishment on them. And Casey has something very similar that the elements combine to bring a conclusion to the dreadful actions of the people. And the actions of the people, as described everywhere, are so similar to what's happening here. We're we're losing our compassion for the earth and and not caring for it and respecting for it. The nature, the way we we once did, we're we're assuming control of it, and people are losing their awareness of of spiritual things, and, and right. everything is very physical, very material. And, and we're also losing touch with what's happening to our planet in the sense that anyone 
with eyes can see that there is going to be an enormous change in the way the climate of this planet works one way or another over mm-hmm. the next 50 years. Mm-hmm. No question whatsoever. Right. Either it's going to be a cataclysm that's going to disrupt uh, 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 with huge storms, like I predicted in my book, Superstorm, or it's going to be a continuous increase in heating, which is going to make gradually make the place virtually unlivable in large areas, most of which are areas we all live in now and, and use for farming. And there's no question about it. And yet we live as if it isn't happening. And right. isn't that really the, the danger? That, that Maybe that was true in the past as well, that they, they, their reaction was to pretend it simply wasn't happening. And then Casey mentions the fact that, uh, that land was sliding down into the ocean because they had, you know, taken the trees away from it and so forth, which is, you know, similar to our deforestation. And um, I don't know. I'm, you know, will it happen? Well, you know, I like to think that there are things we can do to prevent it. Um, if you look back in, in, in history, like to Atlantis and Lemuria, the beginnings for thousands and thousands of years, the people lived happily on the earth without destroying their environment. And the Native Americans here have a reputation of something. They may, maybe they fought among themselves, but they took care of the land. And if people would just raise their consciousness and become aware of what's happening, you know, they could do something about it. Someone had a quote the other day, our, our minds are like parachutes. They work better when they're open. And I feel a lot of my, people's minds are closed right now, and they're so into their daily lives that they don't, they don't think they're not aware. So they're, um, yeah, they're they're absolutely. Well, I see that, of course, up close. Uh, having written a book like Superstorm, and I went on the Today Show and uh, with uh, Art Bell, my co-author, and we were trashed by Matt Lauer, the 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 presenter on the Today Show, who was uh, I'm, I talk about. It, I mean, frankly, he was an ignoramus and. His producer, who had prepped for this, was equally a fool, uh, completely shallow and incapable of seeing anything about what we were talking about. And uh, later, the concept of sudden climate change became very well accepted. In fact, it was accepted in large areas of science even before we wrote the book. But uh, it, it's as if, almost as if there's a kind of a will not to see. Mm-hmm. A, a desire mm-hmm. to, and I can understand that because it means that you have to make changes, you have to make attempts to fix things that seem unfixable, and of course it's not unfixable. It's very fixable. It's not even v- difficult to fix. And the myth that it would cost governments and corporations trillions of dollars to fix the problem is simply that—a myth. Right. Uh, right. Now, but let's. Let's go back a little further. One of the most interesting things about your work in general is the implication that 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 human civilization is actually very very old. Tell us how old do you actually think it is? Well, I I can only go by Edgar Case. Well, Cremo, as you mentioned, will would talk about artifacts that turn up that are even a million years old, but there isn't much evidence of the, of the civilization itself. Edgar Cayce believes that uh, civilizations uh, in Atlantis and Lemuria started 200,000 years ago. And eventually the people were, uh, he talks about just souls who came to the earth and then, you know, checked out and gradually moved into physical forms. So that's about as far back as we can go. I think today the problem is that history started in 10,000 B.C. because they don't, you know, they believe that was the beginning, right. and it wasn't at all. I mean, there were civilizations before that, definitely, that existed. And I, 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 I'll go back to 200,000, but I won't go farther than that, because it's, it's unable to even comprehend that, really. Well, right. And yet, uh, one of the most interesting things about the study of the past is the increasing uh, implication that, that even when, even before... We knew we, we we've ever found fossils of human beings in the modern form. That the earlier forms of man, maybe these were much more intelligent, but in different ways than we give them credit for. Sure, right. So, 
Someone said we're, uh, was it Deepak Chopra, we're spiritual beings having a physical experience. Mm-hmm. And they stayed as spiritual beings, and the physical was just incidental. Their minds focused on so differently from ours, not on material objects, but on, on love and caring and sharing. and uh, Up to a point. Mm, yeah, but true, something... and gradually, just like us, they became, this, uh, science developed more material objects, people moved to the cities, away from the land, lost their contact with it, respect for nature, and so on and so forth. It's just like what's happened to us, and that's what's so interesting about studying these civilizations, is these are old, old legends and, and writings, it's not, and nothing new, and we're doing it. Right. Same. Let me ask you this. I want to get a little bit into the DNA and uh, the blood type stuff. Uh, I thought mm-hmm. that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, so t- t- tell us a little bit about your findings in these areas, if you will. Well, I think the blood type thing came up first, and um, you know they found that the Basques, which is which were descendants of Atlanteans, uh, uh, you know logically and according to Casey, I mean the people moved to the coast of Europe and then moved inland to the mountains when with them when they had any problems. And they were like 75% type O. And then they checked out the mummies in the Canary Islands and they were like 95% type O. And they found type O in the Berbers. And in all these situations, at least in the, in the Basque and the Berbers, it's very different from the people who live around them. Europeans are A and B, not type O. And then they um, found that also some of it in the uh, Native Americans in this country. So this is, you know, one one theory. I mean, the Iroquois are... But uh, anyhow, then they started getting into... Oh, also that a lot of them were own negative. And the negative right. aspect is interesting because that's why they stayed as they were. Because if you uh, marry someone who else who's not own negative and you have a baby... First one's okay, but by the second one, your body's building, making antibodies, and, and you're apt to have a miscarriage, or so that the um, they didn't really reproduce a lot with anyone but their own. Um, the DNA starts with well, there are two aspects. There's the one in the Atlantic Ocean and the one in the Pacific, and it's, this is mitochondrial DNA. And it's called haplogroup X, which scientists say may be of European origin, because that's the best they can do. They don't want to designate Atlantis as the site. But anyhow, they found it, first of all, I think, on the west coast of Ireland, way off on the very edge of the Atlantic Ocean, among an isolated group of men there. Then um, they they found it um, around the Atlantic Ocean. In, in this country, 25% of the Iroquois tribes have haplogroup X and the Ojibwe's and the Sioux. And these, interestingly enough, these are the people that Casey said were descendants of Atlanteans. And, and those are the only ones. I mean, it isn't, it isn't everywhere around. It's not found in Asia at all, except for just a few in the Gobi, which is where this civilization was that I talked about, the Uyghur. Mm-hmm. Casey talks about Atlanteans spending time there. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, and when we get back, we're going to talk a little bit more about who among us now might be able to look to to themselves and say, well, perhaps I was part of this. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. Lemuria and Atlantis takes you beyond the question, were there lost civilizations, and says, yes, the evidence is overwhelming. So let's ask some deeper questions. What happened to them? Why did it happen? What is the message for us today? Lemuria and Atlantis by Shirley Anderson, available from the unknowncountry.com store. Great prices, fast shipping. You can't beat it. Lemuria and Atlantis at unknowncountry.com. The veil between the worlds can fall. The undiscovered country can become your backyard. There is a much larger world behind your backs. It is this world to which man is blind. Man is soul blind and God blind. There is no supernatural. There is only the natural world and you have access to all of it. Souls are part of nature. Your concept of the self 
is constricted. It relates only to this one life. It is tiny. The God within you is unimaginably vast. These are just a few of the things said to me at three o'clock in the morning of June the 6th, 1998, when I was awakened by the master of the key. Get the key. Bring it into your life today. The key available only in this world from the unknown country dot com store. This is Whitley Strieber. We're back with Shirley Andrews talking about Lemuria and Atlantis, studying the past to survive the future. What does the distant, distant past have to tell us now? Well, Shirley says it's a lot. Atlantis and Lemuria were real, and not only that, there's a message for us in that. So let's talk more, Shirley, about the... um, I guess about blood typing, and uh, I think through that we'll get, we'll kind of work around the answer to the question of who might be involved in this today, who might be from that past. Okay. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the DNA as they found in the area of the Pacific, which is really interesting. It's called Hepo Group B. It's found in Aboriginal groups on the coast of Asia and southwestern United States and uh, western coast of South America, and they can tell when people came, and they they came mostly at 11,000, around 11,000 B.C., it said. But anyhow, in the in the New Guinea, where did it start? You know, this is what they're trying to figure out with DNA. Where did it originate? Where's the beginning? And they just don't know. For instance, in the mountains of New Guinea, that's about the farthest back they could go, 40,000 years ago, and there's no trace of an earlier site that's, where it started, supposedly. The same in the in the um, South Pacific. They found it on islands, but there's nothing else. And so they only can say, well, they must have originated on those islands. So it sure does sound like a central civilization that moved to those places uh, long, long ago. Well, you know, there's never been any scientific study of migrations that includes the landforms as they existed in the distant past. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, it's not as if geologists don't know what was above water and what wasn't. They know in considerable detail, like what was above water and what wasn't during the last ice age. But we act as if anything that's below water now could never have been inhabited. (laughs) That's right. When the truth is, people live along coastlines. Therefore, we could be easily looking at, at, at a situation where the fragments that we have now from the distant past were the outdwellers, the upland dwellers, the mountain men, mm-hmm. not the people in the deep, in the real civilizations who were much closer to the to river mouths and to uh, coastlines. I've read uh, that off the coast of New Jersey, they're gradually moving out, finding harpoons made from antlers and things like that, and realizing people live there. But it's a long ways to go. You mentioned about how people might, you know, trace their backgrounds and so forth. Right now, DNA research is very much uh, focused on on health and, and so forth. But it's quite possible to find out. And what all they have to do is, like, gently um, take a small brush and put it on the inside of a person's cheek, and they'll get plenty of cells to check their mitochondrial DNA. And it would be interesting to see if how many have hopo group X, how many have hopo group B. Uh, right. And think well, maybe that's you know they are that's where they started their ancestors. Now let me ask you this: there is in your throughout your book the implication that, they, and I say implication because it's more it's not too directly discussed. It may be, and I may have missed it, uh, th- that there are still active groups in monasteries and places like that who preserve this ancient knowledge intact. You mean like in South America? Yeah. Well, and also in, in Asia. And in Asia. Right, and which we just are never going to know too much about Asia, I'm afraid. A lot of it's in Tibet and the Chinese. Are destroying it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there are a lot of stories uh, and people appearing out of the um, deep in the, from the deep in the Andes. And coming, I heard one man speak, and um, 
he he played some kind of a pipe first, and then I thought, you know, he's channeling this or something. You know, and it, apparently, he he was trained there to come back and to tell us to be careful, to be spiritual, the whole bit. And it's it's coming. And he had grown up way in the remote, remote Andes, and they had sent him out to tell people these things. What actual records they have there, I don't know. There's one fascinating story, speaking of South America, of a man named Father Crispy, and he right. was Portuguese, and he, he was sent there in the 19th century um, into fairly remote Ecuador um, to work with the natives, and they grew to like him. And they brought him um, beautiful, beautiful things. There's pictures in my book of um, a huge... Wand, healing wands with a uh, cadesus on it and a copper crown that's um, too big, way too big for a man's head. It was somebody made for a giant or something and and lots of other beautiful things made of gold. He had a wonderful museum which we, he obtained permission from the Vatican to build this museum and then um, it all burned down and he... Once again. Yeah. yeah. He couldn't he was very, very old. He saved some things, and I have a picture of a of one of the rooms where he just stored a whole lot of junk. And but at, before this happened, he was recognized as a great archaeologist, so to speak. So where did all this? And well, and then to finish the story, um, what happened was that uh, he died, and it just disappeared. I have a feeling the natives took everything back. I don't know. No one. When David Hatcher Childress went there, no one would even talk about it to tell, you know, what what had been there. But where did this all these beautiful, beautiful things come from? Back in the days of, uh, when Pizarro took uh, had had a king of the Incas, and he put him in a room, and he said, "Now I'm only going to let you free if they fill this room with gold as high up as high as you are, something like that." So they started bringing the Incas. Brought, they brought the people brought gold from all over. And uh, then he killed the man before it even, you know, they had enough. So the people bringing it stopped and hid it in caves and so on and so forth. And this is where Father Crespi believed the natives had gotten the things that they brought to him. Well, you know, uh, the and therefore that there may be still people there who know even uh, now. And speaking of hidden, you asked about hidden records. I mean, there are tunnels everywhere in Central and South America that we know about. Under, Le- under uh, yeah, under Cusco, in and fact, under and under Cusco. Lima. Right. Yeah. And the Lolton Caverns in Central America. Tell us about them. They, they, they extend on and on and on, and they're, you know, all kinds of labyrinths and drop-offs, and, and they're dangerous to go into. And the natives don't, had never had anything to do with them, but they go, people go, have gone in them and have found like carvings of giants and hieroglyphs on the walls. And one of the men who did a lot of research there back in the 19th century, Lepogian, said that he had um, become disgusted with the governments who were stealing all his things, and he, he hid records from the Maya in them. And I believe the Maya probably hid things there when the Spaniards came. Who knows? Yeah, probably. That they are very extensive. Some of them were carved out by people. I mean, it, it, it enlarged what was already there. And it's thought that, well, for two sort of reasons. One, perhaps, for ceremonies and secret initiations and things. And another was because people were forced to live in them during times of um, natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, and so on and so forth. But uh, they definitely, you know, there are some evidence of human habitation in them. They're a great place to hide things. Yes. And do you think they're that they're probably still hidden there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. How so about when, going in them now? Is that possible? Going in them now. Well, yeah, there's a Canadian uh, university that's working at it. Um, it's pretty, you know, it's hard because it's um, there's awful spiders. And right. There's plants that are worse than our poison ivy, and there's dropouts. There's, they're dark. There's no air. I mean, right. But they're definitely working on it. There's a website. I'm trying to think what it is. But if you look, you can just look up Lolton, L-O-L-T-U-N, Caverns, and you'll find evidence of the people who are exploring them today. are exploring them today. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland, and we're going to be doing some deep exploring in just a moment. We'll be right back. 
The veil between the worlds can fall. The undiscovered country can become your backyard. There is a much larger world behind your backs. It is this world to which man is blind. Man is soul blind and God blind. There is no supernatural. There is only the natural world and you have access to all of it. Souls are part of nature. Your concept of the self is constricted. It relates only to this one life. It is tiny. The God within you is unimaginably vast. These are just a few of the things said to me at three o'clock in the morning of June the 6th, 1998, when I was awakened by the master of the key. Get the key. Bring it into your life today. The key available only in this world from the unknown country dot com store. Lemuria and Atlantis takes you beyond the question, were there lost civilizations, and says, yes, the evidence is overwhelming. So let's ask some deeper questions. What happened to them? Why did it happen? What is the message for us today? Lemuria and Atlantis by Shirley Anderson, available from the unknowncountry.com store. Great prices, fast shipping. You can't beat it. Lemuria and Atlantis at unknowncountry.com. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're talking to Shirley Andrews, Lemuria and Atlantis. And, you know, Shirley, one of the most extraordinary, maybe the biggest lesson that I'm seeing in all of this is the lesson of the fact that we no longer know, that we've lost the thread. And the implication that on this earth there are people who do know, who have not lost the thread, but who keep this secret. Now, what would be their motive for keeping it secret? Is it is it something to do with our need to learn from this new experience without gaining from the from the knowledge gained in the past, or what is it? Well, I'm not quite sure who you mean. I mean, certainly well, in the mon- in the monasteries, say in Tibet mm-hmm. or in in the Himalaya and in the uh, Andes. Oh yes, those secret archives and things, right? right? I think they just don't trust us, and and some of them, whatever they reveal, they feel we're not ready for, uh, that we're, you know, we're too materialistic, and we wouldn't we wouldn't understand it, and we wouldn't be able to take it, to do the right thing with it. Always, uh, societies have, um, secret societies have hidden information. It was a source of power over the masses. Now, that isn't, I don't think, quite what you're thinking of today. But, um, Native Americans, you know, they, they were tortured by the, by the Spaniards and so forth, and they hid lots of things. And gradually some of them are releasing information. Most of this was uh, not written in documents, but passed down from grandparents and great-grandparents. And some of them are, are writing today to tell what they have, have to offer about the past, going back as far as Atlantis. Um, because, you know, they're beginning, you know, they're beginning to see if they don't, it'll ne- no one will ever know. And perhaps they're trusting us a little more than they used to. But, um, Monasteries in Asia, why it's just it's called esoteric knowledge and it's not to be shared with the masses. And and the masses, us That's are, right. are greatly <laughs> greatly harmed by it in a way because if we knew really what had happened in the past, maybe we could use that knowledge to help ourselves now. That's right. That's a very good point. Sure. Definitely. When we see that we're doing, you know, we can see ways that they work, the things that worked for them and things that didn't. Um, in Atlantis, there were two groups of people, and um, the sons of Belial and, and the children of the Law of One. And the sons of Belial were pretty wicked and disrupt, just, you know, very um, immoral, and they they were bad. <laughs> and then you have the, the sons of the Law of One, children of the Law of One, who focused on meditation and uh, they were very spiritual, and they saw what was happening to Atlantis, and they believed the thing to do was to 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 get away from it all, so that they could really focus on um, making things better. But it didn't work. Uh, and today, the whole what people are doing, I don't, some of them I think know this, and they realize that they have there's much more power in in group meditation and thought. And I, I believe that. 
there I think are that very strongly. A lot of websites that are um, one of them. My sister is GlobalMeditations dot com. Is always they're organizing on this day at this time. We will all think about X for peace or helping the environment in a specific specific reasons. Churchill did this during World War Two. I'm old enough to remember that at noon when the when the clock at Big Ben in London struck, everybody was to stop and pray for peace or think of peace. And there's power in that. There's energy in our thoughts. Well, there's also another energy out there. For example, there's a project at Princeton uh, that is continuously monitoring a uh, the Earth's, I believe it's the mag- Earth's magnetic field. A- and, it, th- th- and during, right before 911 unfolded, right before the jets hit, there was a disturbance that seemed to suggest that there was an, a kind of inner knowledge building in a lot of people that this was something terrible was about to happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A- and it, we are a, we're not what we seem. We feel like very isolated little units, each one of us. I'm me, and I'm I, I'm not the person next to me, and I am totally completely unrelated to the people in the temples in, in the uh, monasteries of the in the Andes or in Tibet and, uh, but it's not true is it we're all one we're all the same and that's what we need to really believe and we're I mean many ways we're the same as as, as some Don was saying there's a lot of characteristics that are the same and we just have to stop dwelling on the differences what would you say the most important message of Atlantis and Lemuria is? Hmm. Well, I think the idea... Oh, wow, that's a, that's a hard one. I think, you know, that we're really... Are, that we are, should be, as some of them were, 50% spiritual, 50% material. We really have to focus more on the spiritual aspects to of get, life. To get back to what we really are. The, right, you know, as we once were. And, of course, the preservation of the earth and how important that is. It's just so obvious. You know, I had a, a gentleman from uh, the Casey Foundation on a few weeks ago who has found some um, some new remains in the Bahamas. Oh, Greg Little. Greg mm-hmm. Little, yeah. And one of the things that happened during the program, literally right at the beginning of the program, was I, I, be- I came, found myself in psychic contact with a person he had written about in his book. And uh, with a, an old gentleman on the island of Andros who claims to be the keeper of a temple. Oh, yeah. Which mm-hmm. is there. Mm-hmm. And it was really an extraordinary experience. And I, I, I have a feeling that there's, a, there's just above the level of the ordinary, this whole past world is kind of still there waiting to speak to us if we listen. Well, you know, there are a lot of people who have learned how, for instance, uh, shamans by means of initiations. But some of those are pretty severe on, on the body. And then you have the indigenous healers who can reach the other world, make their way through the veil, however you want to say, and using hallucinogenic drugs, uh, drums, dancing, sleep deprivation, all different things like that. But you know who really already has a lot of it are the children. They are much closer to the other side than we are. They haven't been here so long, and and they aren't so focused on on language to to express themselves or to learn. And we need to develop their insights and and respect their dreams and help them to develop the right side of their brain. And I get so sad today when I see, oh, this four-year-old, he's got to learn to read. Well, wait a minute. He's got to develop his mind first and make himself a more broad person and so that's these are all my thoughts here also i just believe very strongly in meditation and that's the way all of us can can learn to access um a a higher a higher level other other worlds other areas thoughts just come if you let them be open in the united states i see us as actually attacking our children it's not so true in the rest of the world but we give them bad food at school we mm-hmm. educate them very poorly. We inundate them with the message of, uh, of uh, with a message of powerlessness and materialism. We totally overprogram them. So overprogram them, right? 
and uh, they what what comes out of that are, are immeasurably diminished human beings who are spiritually terribly impoverished, mm -hmm. especially compared to children in other parts of the world. Right. right, right. So that's that's quite a that's that's a great problem. On the one hand, on the other hand, there are caring parents out there and extraordinary children coming, it seems sometimes, just to the right parents. Well, there's an awful lot of homeschooling going on. I yeah. didn't realize how much, but it's pretty extensive. And those kids turn out very well. My uh, one, of my, one of my cousins homeschooled both of her kids, mm, and wonderful. they turned out fabulous. Yeah. I mean, they're now extraordinary young adults, both of them uh, engaged in... Uh, uh, in careers that are really carrying good careers as well, mm -hmm. you know? so mm -hmm. they're, uh, it's doable, right? You know, and they're right. yeah, absolutely. So that's a place to begin. <laughs> a lot of places to begin. A lot of places to begin. Well, one place to begin for sure is with Lemuria and Atlantis. Shirley Andrews, what happens when a person kind of goes beyond the question? Did they exist at all? And says, well, yes, these remains exist all over the world. So, yes, something was there. Now, what was it and what does it have to say to us? And she ends up writing a really amazing and wonderful book. Shirley, I'd like to thank you so much for being with us. It was an amazing and wonderful experience to talk to you, just as I thought it would be. Well, good. I thoroughly enjoyed it, too. Well, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back with Linda Moulton Howe. Lemuria and Atlantis takes you beyond the question, were there lost civilizations, and says, yes, the evidence is overwhelming. So let's ask some deeper questions. What happened to them? Why did it happen? What is the message for us today? Lemuria and Atlantis by Shirley Anderson, available from the unknowncountry.com store. Great prices, fast shipping. You can't beat it. Lemuria and Atlantis at unknowncountry.com. And now a feature that we've gotten an awful lot of great email about. Ann Streber, executive editor of the UnknownCountry.com news page, is going to be reading from the UnknownCountry.com news, the best news of the edge in the world, which is why you've made it the best edge website in the world. Here's Ann Streber. Is Stephen Hawking being tortured? 62-year-old physicist Stephen Hawking, who is paralyzed by Lou Gehrig's disease, is in the hospital because he may have been tortured by someone close to him. Hawking, who is best known for his book A Brief History of Time, is now in the hospital and a police investigation has been launched and claims that he's been seen with mysterious cuts and bruises, as well as being left outside in his wheelchair, where he suffered from sunburn and heat stroke. One nurse says leaving him there stranded was a form of torture. Police detectives are waiting for him to leave intensive care before they question him. They also want to talk to his second wife, Elaine, a nurse he married 14 years ago. A source says the family are worried sick. They've been suspicious for some time that someone's been harming Stephen. The children are desperate to stop it but don't know what to do because he refuses to admit it. Stephen is famously one of the most intelligent men in the country, so he must know what's going on. His family first contacted the police in 2000 because they were worried about a series of mysterious injuries he had, including a broken wrist. But Hawking has refused to allow police to question him and his wife in separate rooms. One source says he was absolutely adamant his home life was his own affair and refused to admit there was anything wrong. It was frustrating, but there was nothing more the police could do other than keep an eye on it. Now it looks like the same thing might be happening again. The family suspects that he's being tortured by someone who has a mental disease known as Munchausen's by proxy. Munchausen's disease causes people to physically harm themselves in order to get attention. And Munchausen's by proxy, people hurt other people in order to get attention, and this often happens with mothers harming their children. Stephen Hawking has recently denied being tortured in an update to this story. However, the evidence still remains the same. A falling ice block just misses an elderly woman in New Zealand. In New Zealand, a football-sized block of ice smashed through the roof and into the kitchen of 80-year-old Jan Robertson, who says, There was this terrific bang, like goodness knows what. I could have been in there cutting up vegetables. There was debris on the toaster, on the kettle, and everywhere. She called the fire department. Fireman John Sweeney says they were skeptical until we saw it for ourselves. 
This happened the previous week in the same neighborhood when the ice block fell on the house of Pat Theobald, who says, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Robertson assumes the ice fell from a plane since they're in a flight path and often hear jets overhead. She says, where else could it come from? These ice blocks have been falling from the sky all over the world in the last few years. An unknown country is one of the few places where we've reported it. Planes are often seen overhead when the blocks fall, leading to the conclusion that the planes are emptying their chemical toilets while flying overhead. However, planes do not do this, and no traces of chemicals have been found in any of the ice. This phenomenon is caused by global warming. When the lower atmosphere gets warmer, the layer of air just above it where planes fly gets colder. This causes contrails to freeze, dropping to ice to earth as blocks of ice. These ice blocks have even crashed into bedrooms, just missing sleeping people. If data on these ice blocks was gathered by an international agency, planes could be ordered to fly to lower altitudes so their contrails wouldn't freeze. It's already been discovered that contrails turn into cirrus clouds, which trap heat that rises from the earth, increasing global warming. If planes fly 6,000 feet lower, it will reduce contrails by 47%. Death Flights A 19-year-old British woman died Monday while flying on a Virgin Atlantic plane from Miami to Heathrow Airport. The day before, two passengers on a British Airways flight from Miami to Heathrow died. One of them might have had viral meningitis. On Monday, the Virgin Atlantic passenger died shortly before landing. The crew tried to revive her, and a doctor came forward to help, but the woman was pronounced dead on arrival. The cause of death is unknown. On Sunday, a woman flying on British Airways from Miami to Heathrow became ill, and the aircraft was diverted to Nova Scotia so she could receive emergency treatment, but she died anyway. It's not clear if she died on the plane or in the hospital. A man on the same plane became ill after the flight took off again, and he died shortly before arriving at Heathrow. He's thought he, it's thought he died of viral meningitis, and the woman may have had a heart attack, so the two deaths may not be related. Viral meningitis causes inflammation of the t- tissues that cover the brain and spinal cord, and it's only contagious in very close contact. It can be caused by a virus, bacteria, or fungus. It's usually only fatal in people with weak immune systems. So there have been two mysterious deaths on two British flights from Miami to England on two consecutive days. And last but not least, be sure to check our website for the incredible new UFO photo posted there from the official website of the city of Wittersley in Australia. This was taken by a traffic engineer at a railroad crossing using a digital camera and shows an extraordinarily clear image of a UFO. As so often happens in these cases, he didn't notice the UFO in the photo until he downloaded the photo onto his computer. This has been the news from unknowncountry.com. Next up, Linda Moulton Howe. One reporter who loves mysteries is radio's leading science journalist, Linda Moulton Howe. She's an Emmy Award-winning TV producer, documentary filmmaker, and writer who investigates new and unusual aspects of science, medicine, and the environment. Today, she has a special report for us on some ultra-high strangeness events in an Oregon man's life. Here she is from Philadelphia, Linda Moulton Howe. Thanks, Whitley. Well, you know, 2004 has begun with some spectacular sightings of unidentified sky objects over the Napoleon, Michigan region, not far from where an unusually large ice circle was found in December. And the more I investigated the ice circle, the more I learned from local residents about mysterious lights and unidentified flying objects haunting that area for years. In my recent earthfiles.com, Dreamland, and Coast to Coast AM radio news reports, I have presented some of those eyewitnesses. And this week, I received an email from a businessman named Michael McNeil, who has lived in the state of Oregon all his life and most recently near Portland. His email contained descriptions of three unusual flying objects that he, friends, and his family had seen over the years, including a large triangle of stars slowly moving overhead that many other people have described to me now and from past sightings going back as far as the 1970s. He included a phone number and invited me to call if I had any questions about his email. I did call him and ask if I could record his experiences on the record for earthfiles.com and Dreamland. 
He began with his most recent sighting three months ago in November 2003. But to my surprise, as has happened in other interviews over the years with normal citizens who have seen strange objects in the sky, the recall led to even more startling memories of a close-up encounter with non-human entities. I noticed something that moved uh, in my line of sight over the roof of the neighbor's house. And at first I thought it was a mylar balloon. And I kept watching it, and it moved oddly. It was like it was wobbling, like a child top. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I noticed underneath it had kind of a brownish or maybe a, like a tarnished copper colored dome in the center of it that was about a third of the diameter of the whole craft and it was basically like a disc shape that the edges were rounded and uh, the rest of the craft was silver colored. This thing was moving against the prevailing wind. The winds were blowing from west to east and this thing was moving from south to north towards me. And uh, it dawned on me that it wasn't a balloon, that it was larger. And plus it had this, you know, dome, dome protrusion on the bottom of it. So I ran in the house to get a pair of binoculars, and I was probably in the house probably not more than 15 or 20 seconds. I ran back out to the same spot, and this thing was gone. It was like it disappeared, only I, I wasn't there to see it. Now, have you seen any small disc craft like this before? Um, yes. One night uh, I saw a craft. Actually, I was with my mother and my sister. It was when I was going to college, so it must have been in, on Thanksgiving evening. Uh, 1979 or 80, I looked and I saw something, uh, I could see it through the trees, and then uh, it was over the top of them, and I said, wow, that looks like a UFO, and I asked my sister to stop the car, and my mother said, that does look like a UFO, stop the car, so she did, and I pulled off to the side of the road, turned the engine off, and the thing made no sound. And it had large windows around it uh, that were, I don't know how big they were exactly. It was probably two or three hundred yards out into over the field, a uh, large open field. And the windows uh, were like the por proportions of a four by eight sheet of plywood, but with rounded corners. But I think it, the windows might have been a little larger than that. And the light that came out of these windows was very intense, but it was the color of tungsten lighting, as you see from a window outside the house at night, mm -hmm. kind of a slight yellowish, orangish color. And uh, I was, of course, trying to see through the windows to see if I could see any, you know, humanoids inside this thing. And uh, it was kind of a hat box shape on top, circular, with uh, flat sides where the windows were, and then it tapered down from there, and I couldn't see the underneath side of the craft, but it appeared to be flat. And it paralleled the Southern Pacific Railroad track for a little ways, maybe like an eighth of a mile or so, and then uh, it crossed over the highway and followed the highway right over the top of it. And we probably watched it for about four or five minutes. And it headed over right over the top of a small little town. And uh, then we got back in the car and drove on. Did any of you talk about what you thought it was, where it had come from, that sort of thing? Well, yeah, we did. Um, I guess we just assumed that it was extraterrestrial because you know, the U.S. government, as far as I know, doesn't have anything uh, remotely similar to it. And if it were extraterrestrial, that big, that close, 
what did you think the implication was? Um, I've always thought they were surveying the planet for something, but I, I don't understand what. And when you say that, is that based on some personal experience with something you you consider to be non-human? Well, I had contact uh, when I was probably about 11 years old. Um, one night I was lying in bed uh, in my folks' house, and um, I wasn't asleep, and I felt like there was something in the room, and I, I looked up and looked down at the end of my bed, and uh, there was this little guy about, I don't know, three and a half feet tall standing at the end of the bed. And I was scared, but I couldn't, I couldn't yell. I wanted to yell for my foot. And um, I felt there was something else, and I looked at the other corner of the foot of the bed, and there was another one standing there. And uh, I was, you know, just frightened out of my mind, but I couldn't speak. And I was totally awake. And uh, I want, you know, like I said, I wanted to scream or yell or something. And it was like my vocal cords wouldn't work or I couldn't get them to work as hard as I tried. And uh, they, moved, they moved in an odd fashion um, for a just a moment. They moved like in jerky motion. It's hard to explain, but they bobbed their heads and their upper body forward in perfect unison. Mm -hmm. They were coming towards me. And uh, one of them started speaking to me uh, in direct mental communication. And he was trying to, or I say he, it was trying to quiet me down and uh, told me not to be afraid, uh, they weren't going to harm me, and things of that nature. And he asked me if I would go with them, and I told him I didn't want to go with them. And he finally convinced me to go, said that everything was going to be all right, and he lifted the covers off of me. And I sat up in bed and walked over towards the door, and one was in front of me and one was behind me. And I started, I, I started to try and walk, and they were amused by this, and uh, because my feet weren't on the floor, uh, it was like they were maybe six inches or a foot off from the floor, and we floated out towards the stairway and through the wall, and I looked up, and there was a disc up over. Uh, the backyard of the house, and I remember looking down at an apple tree that's right next to the house, and we went up into the craft from a beam of light, and underneath the craft there were, I think, three or four panels that looked like, uh, almost like uh, fluorescent lighting, mm -hmm. you know, fluorescent overhead lighting panel, but they were tapered. And when we went into the craft, I don't understand how we got in there. Uh, other than we went through it somehow. What happened next to Michael McNeil? We'll learn more right after this break. This is Linda Moulton Howe, science reporter and editor from earthfiles.com, reporting for Dreamland. The work of Linda Moulton Howe, the amazing work of Linda Moulton Howe, the world's greatest reporter of edge news and edge topics. She has got a website, earthfiles.com. Go there frequently. You will never, never forget what you find on earthfiles.com. The best website, the best reporting of its kind in the world. Linda Moulton Howe, earthfiles.com. Don't miss a single day. The veil between the worlds can fall. The undiscovered country can become your backyard. There is a much larger world behind your backs. It is this world to which man is blind. Man is soul blind and God blind. There is no supernatural. There is only the natural world and you have access to all of it. Souls are part of nature. Your concept of the self 
is constricted. It relates only to this one life. It is tiny. The God within you is unimaginably vast. These are just a few of the things said to me at three o'clock in the morning of June the 6th in 1998 when I was awakened by the master of the key. Get the key. Bring it into your life today. The key available only in this world from the unknown country dot com store. Michael McNeil told me the small beings who took him from his bedroom had large black eyes and gray, rough-looking skin. Michael does not remember how he and the beings traveled into the disk hovering above his house and through what looked like large angled panels of bright white fluorescent lights, but now he continues with what he does remember next. I was lying on a table, and they were... They flashed a bunch of images into my head in rep- rapid succession. Uh, it was like something you'd see on television, where you see, they flash all these different images of war and Hitler and, you know, just all sorts of different things, and an atomic explosion. And uh, I didn't understand it, but other than it was supposed to be things that would happen in the future of the planet. And what year... And months do you think this was? It was probably, I'm trying to think, 1962. And uh, the, the interesting part of this story is uh, the next morning I woke up in bed and I sat straight up in bed. And, and I was trying to figure out what happened. And... Uh, I knew I hadn't been dreaming, and I was just trying to sort it all out in my head, and I swung my legs off from the the bed and was sitting on the edge of the bed, and I looked down at my right uh, foot, kind of in the ankle area. There was blood running down it, and it hurt, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with it, you know, and uh, I could feel something in uh, sort of, in the top of my foot where the ankle joint is and there was a a small cut probably about maybe a quarter of an inch long or three sixteenths of an inch long and uh, so I got dressed and went to school and uh, my ankle hurt all day and when I came home that afternoon uh, I sterilized my pocket knife with uh, a match or a candle and wiped the carbon off from the blade and dug around and I could feel something in my foot and I dug it out and it looked like um, a thin piece of glass that was an elongated triangle shape and it was probably maybe a, oh, half an inch long or maybe a little less and it was perfectly clear and flat on uh, each side. And I believe it might have been some kind of a crystal. And it took me a long time to figure out what it was, but I think it was some sort of tracking device, some way of locating human beings. Where is that? Where is it? Mm-hmm. It's gone. Um, I put the object uh, in a drawer in a table next my bed, and about a week and a half later, I looked for it, because I just dropped along the edge of the drawer, and it was gone, and uh, it was like it had disappeared, and I don't know if they came and retrieved it while I was asleep, or what happened, it wasn't there. Why do you think that they showed you atomic explosions and scenes that seemed to involve catastrophe? Well, I think that probably, uh, I know, you know, there have been thousands upon thousands of uh, people that were attacked, and uh, I know that some of them, they tried to show them what was happening in the future. They tried tried to show humans that. And uh, I think they're, they want us to avoid some things in the future. And right now, do you have any sense of 
uh, anything impending? Uh, are you nervous about anything upcoming? No, not more than anyone else. Other, you know, just terrorist attacks. But, uh, uh, so you haven't had any uh, recent dreams in the last few months about anything impending? No, I have. It's, I don't know. The whole thing is just odd to me. I can't figure it out. Um, they're, it's like they're doing a survey of the planet, just the way scientists study, you know, the forests in Africa or the forests in the U.S. and the animals that live in them. So from your experience with those creatures in your room that scared you, you still don't feel that they meant you any harm or they, that they don't mean anybody any harm? No, um, I don't think they want to hurt anyone, and, uh, or at least, you know, I mean, that implant that they put in my foot, it hurt, but it didn't kill me, you know. Mm -hmm. And you were able to get it out successfully without any problem. Right. Um, I think they expected it to stay there and heal over the top of it and probably would have tracked me as long as it was in there. <laughs> Hearing these unexpected revelations come from an Oregon businessman reminded me of the national survey done by the Roper Organization in 1992 about unusual personal experiences. The report for mental health professionals represented three national surveys of nearly 6,000 adult Americans about the relationship between their unusual experiences and what was labeled the UFO abduction syndrome. The Roper Report's astonishing conclusion was that, quote, the incidence of abduction experiences appears to be on the order of at least 2% of the population, unquote. In 2004, the United States population is 292 million. 2% of that is 5,840,000 men, women, and children. This is Linda Moulton Howe, science reporter and editor of EarthFiles.com, reporting for Dreamland. Well, thank you very much, Linda. That was a, an awesome report. I might also point out that we had another implant, or have still, I believe, another implant very much like that, which we have studied, uh, a glass-like implant from the body of a gentleman named Jesse Long, who had a childhood experience quite similar to this one. So yes. uh, I think that the details that this gentleman was describing are so classic that uh, it quite, quite probably is exactly what it sounds like. And thank you for an extraordinary report. The work of Linda Moulton Howe, the amazing work of Linda Moulton Howe, the world's greatest reporter of edge news and edge topics. She has got a website, earthfiles.com. Go there frequently. You will never, never forget what you find on earthfiles.com. The best website, the best reporting of its kind in the world. Linda Moulton Howe, earthfiles.com. Don't miss a single day. The veil between the worlds can fall. The undiscovered country can become your backyard. There is a much larger world behind your backs. It is this world to which man is blind. Man is soul blind and God blind. There is no supernatural. There is only the natural world and you have access to all of it. Souls are part of nature. Your concept of the self is constricted. It relates only to this one life. It is tiny. The God within you is unimaginably vast. These are just a few of the things said to me at three o'clock in the morning of June the 6th in 1998 when I was awakened by the master of the key. Get the key. Bring it into your life today. The key available only in this world from the unknowncountry.com store. Next week on Dreamland, P.M.H. Atwater talks about something extraordinary that's happening 
are our children evolving into what is in effect a new species? Well, she's amassed some extraordinary evidence based on childhood near-death experiences and the explosion in the IQs of our children, yours and mine. It's going to be extremely exciting, plus a very, very special subscriber interview a scientist who had a close encounter of the third kind and was able to ob observe a UFO in operation. It revolutionized his understanding of gravity, and he's going to be talking to our subscribers about what he thinks he saw on a UFO. Really incredible, incredible. Very happy to welcome Shirley Andrews to this radio program. She's written a book called Lemuria in Atlantis, Studying the Past to Survive the Future, that goes beyond where we usually are with this subject. Where we usually are with this subject is, was there a Lemuria? Was there an Atlantis? But Shirley is, is very far beyond that. Uh, she's had a lifelong interest in prehistory. She's conducted a lot of research in the U.S. at the British Museum in London, uh, she has been to monasteries in the Himalayas, the Azores, the Andes, Central America. Uh, she's been at the Tio Bastillo Cave in Spain. And she is really, oh, also she's the author of another book, Atlantis, Insights from a Lost Civilization. So we're going to be looking at this in a very different way today. Uh, Shirley, welcome to the program. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Well, uh, first of all, you're absolutely convinced that these civilizations existed. Oh, yes. There's no doubt in my mind. And I, there were others, too. A lot has happened on the Earth since, um, since ours began. So you would, be, you would be more in your attitude or your ideas about the distant past, like someone like Michael Cremo, who believes that there were quite a number of civilizations de dating back deep into the past, far, far deeper than conventional science believes. Right, and I just read it, I, I agree totally, a book called Cataclysm, which has helped me a lot to understand what happened to these civilizations. You know, if you want me to explain briefly. The, yes, please do. I mean, basically he's saying that something came into our solar system from outer space. It was a big chunk, it wasn't an asteroid, and it wasn't a comet because it, it had gravitational field. And his gravitational field attracted objects from our solar system and affected them. And he has a lot of things that happened as a result of it. But it came too close to the Earth. A lot of these objects dropped on the Earth's surface, making pockmarks, huge things that are visible today. And it, corrupt, it, it tilted our axis. It caused the, um, which caused it to shift a little bit. And, and the, the water in the oceans raised up and back down up towards the poles. Just imagine, we're like a top going around, and something disturbed it. In the meantime, it affected the Earth's crust, which really isn't very thick, and it sort of crumpled. And as a result, things changed. Mountains went up, and, and, uh, and islands went down, and basically it set off a lot of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. And just imagine, like, bam in Iran happening all over the world. People didn't have much of a chance. And all the legends and stories describe this. Uh, and they refer to the flood, which is understandable. And I mean, I'm not going into the details, but that's the general idea of what happened. Yeah, I understand. But what you're saying essentially is that there were, uh, there have been, it has been a great deal more upheaval in the past then our, our conventional science is willing to admit. That's true. They say things happen. Well, there's, there's two branches now. I think these people who are known as sort of the cataclysm, cataclysmists right. are gaining increasing popularity and respect, and I think it's, it's going to come. This is, the, you know, the, we haven't. Just think what happened when something hit Jupiter not too long ago. I mean, what if that right. hit the Earth? I mean, of course. Well, it will happen that way, and <laughs> so. Uh, but but you're saying that these cataclysms have been intense, intense enough, not just to destroy civilizations, but to uh, so completely distort our memory of them that uh, uh, that it's really just it's almost all lost. It becomes myth rather than memory. 
Well, I think the reason for that is because nothing survived very well. I mean, you know, our books and records would all be gone. The only thing that's really survived are, are writings in stone. And there are a few other things here and there in, in the mountains that have people have found in, in Asia with information about the motherland of Mu, for instance, Lemuria. Well, let's talk about um, some of those things. I think um, I had three main sources uh, for my information about Lemuria. None of it is channeled. I just have to make that really clear. Um, the main one was Church Word, a British, um, a British soldier who was sent to India. I spent a lot of time there, got to know a monk in a temple, who eventually they were friends. The monks that taught him how to read a, a script that they called Nikal. And then he said, I have some records that are hidden, very secret archives. They've been there for thousands of years. And they brought one out, and they translated together, and it was all about Lemuria. And then he brought out a few more. And the problem is these were secret. They will never be released. But Church Word um, really became convinced that they were true. Partly, Church Word was interesting. He invented a kind of steel that our government bought the patent for and used to make helmets for our soldiers in World War I. It was so strong. From this, he got the money, and he spent his whole life traveling in the Far East in Central America, learning more and more about Lemuria and writing about it. So that was a good source. Another good source, which also came from the Far East, was, um, was from the Rosicrucians. And a man, came, a monk, came to their headquarters in California, in the 1920s, and he said, I have some documents here that we've been saving for thousands of years, and we're a little worried about what's going to happen in China, and we want to give them to you for safekeeping and authorize you to publish what's in them. And these turned out to also have information about Lemuria. And the Rosicrucians appointed someone to write it who was interested in this topic, and he did, and he said, I'm, I didn't change anything. I just put down what's, what was in these things, and some of it's a little far out. But that, you know, again, I included some of it in my book. And what I want is to open people's minds and let them make their own decision about what to believe about things that happened so long ago. Also, Edgar Casey did uh, offer quite a bit about Lemuria, and so I included that. Does that help answer the question? Well, yeah. And it, Pretty long-winded it, it, there. It, no, no, no. We're interested in listening to you. Uh, uh, so the more you have, the more information you have to offer us, the better. Uh, let me ask you now about physical remains. I am very familiar with Nan Madal. I've never been there, but uh, I've read a lot and learned a lot about it because I consider it a particularly important, mysterious remain. And uh, But tell us, you have mentioned quite a few of them in Lemurian Atlantis. I had a, a list which someone sent me of 36 places, islands in the Pacific, with pyramids, um, hieroglyphic writing, um, statues, giant statues, megalithic buildings, not on quite on the scale of Nam Modell, but, but pretty impressive. There's also a really interesting website that if you go to templeofmu.com slash index, there uh, you will see off the coast of Okinawa a temple it has a turtle on the top of it, which is larger than the man swimming around it. There is a road around the bottom, but um, these there are more and more in the Pacific being that's being found, partly because it isn't so deep there as in the Atlantic Ocean, and um, it's more available to just scuba divers. Then, um, let's see what else? Of course, Easter Island is a classic. Uh, that island isn't big enough to support the civilization that built those huge platforms weighing some of the stones of 100 tons in them and the colossal statues on them. And the people of Amuri, of Easter Island, when they first approached, really said they believed that the, um, you know, that the island had been part of a larger island long ago. And that's who built these things. So, uh, and therefore you believe that the, that the, uh, what appear to be megalithic remains, uh, near, um, I believe it's the island of Shuri and off Okinawa? Mm-hmm. Well, if, you know, if they, if they aren't Lemurian, 
they were built when the ocean levels were higher, which you is... You mean lower. I mean lower, yeah. sorry. When, the, this, when that area was above the surface, and obviously people lived there, and that was close to 10,000 years ago. Right. The same off the coast of Japan, off the coast of India, and off the coast of Formosa, they're finding things that indicate people did things with the rocks that were already there or actually built building, built ruins, built walls, built whatever. I mean, whatever, yeah. There's controversy about yeah. it, but but there's certainly the human hand was there. Okay, and this is this is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. Lemuria and Atlantis takes you beyond the question, were there lost civilizations, and says, yes, the evidence is overwhelming. So let's ask some deeper questions. What happened to them? Why did it happen? What is the message for us today? Lemuria and Atlantis by Shirley Anderson, available from the unknowncountry.com store. Great prices, fast shipping. You can't beat it. Lemuria and Atlantis at unknowncountry.com. The veil between the worlds can fall. The undiscovered country can become your backyard. There is a much larger world behind your backs. It is this world to which man is blind. Man is soul blind and God blind. There is no supernatural. There is only the natural world and you have access to all of it. Souls are part of nature. Your concept of the self is constricted. It relates only to this one life. It is tiny. The God within you is unimaginably vast. These are just a few of the things said to me at 3 o'clock in the morning of June the 6th in 1998 when I was awakened by the master of the key. Get the key. Bring it into your life today. The key available only in this world from the unknowncountry.com store. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back. We're talking with Shirley Andrews, Lemuria and Atlantis, and we're going to begin to go beyond the usual place where we dwell when we're talking about these subjects. Usually we're talking about did they exist or not. And, uh, however, Shirley is convinced not only that they existed, but that there is a message for us, a very important message from the past. And we're going to begin to delve into that message. You know, Shirley, one of the most interesting things in your book were, is the quotes from people who have written you uh, after your first book came out, uh, Atlantis Insights from a Lost Civilization, telling you of their own past life memories. Right, and, and some of them are dreams. I'll tell you one dream story. I was in the local store and talking with the owner who had just published a cookbook about the problems of publishers, and a man walking by heard me say Atlantis, and he came up to me and he said, Oh, he said, Please, can, can I talk to you? I, I need your help. I'm having this horrible dream. I know what happened in Atlantis, and I did something that I'm just not very proud of now, and, and can you explain why? And, you know, it's that kind of thing that really, I put that one in my book, really inspired me to write because there's so much interest. There are people everywhere. Wherever I went and spoke, there were people who really had had experiences, had stories to tell me of all kinds. One man in Phoenix said, I grew up in Poland, and we learned about Atlantis there. It, and that's I learned while well, in the far in the in the Eastern Europe. It's much more uh, respected to uh, scientists and people who who are concerned about it. And the widespread interest really amazed me. And, and I went to the West Coast, and they stepped asking me about Lemuria, and I really didn't know that much. I was I knew it was a seafaring civilization in the Pacific, sort of was in my first book. But then things kept happening, like I sat down at a conference next to Churchward's goddaughter, who I've already mentioned, and she was very close to him, as was her father, and telling me, you know, giving me sources and helping me so much to write it with the information. Um, how the only I thing I could recall about James Churchward myself was an amazing... Uh something I read of his years ago about the Lord's Prayer. Does that ring a bell at all with you? Oh, um, translated into another language, and what each word, how it it was old. That it was that it that he used to th say that it was a very very ancient prayer. Right, yeah. right. And he had he had a he had even the words. He was very big on symbols and so forth that it had been in somewhere else. 
Well, I think in the past people really believed in one one creator, if right. you want to call it, one God, whatever. And this certainly is focused on that. He's a very, very. He was a quite an extraordinarily interesting man, a real original uh, of the uh, of the kind that we don't have anymore. Yeah, uh, a, a Renaissance man. Y- yeah, you know, like even a good fisherman. <laughs> right. The whole bit. Right. And uh, you know, he um, he really did to me prove the text of what he had seen in India by his cross references and his facts and. His well, the legends, the whole bit. And it was just amazing that he wrote as much detail without a computer. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know well, how people ever did it. Yeah, well, there was a time when they did it by candlelight uh, or even by oil lamp <laughs> even light. Even harder. <laughs> using wax tablets, and, and right. they were pretty prolific, too.